and so I'm going to preach um, a, a sermon out of the triumphal entry today. But before we get there, we're going to jump into Proverbs like we do every week for a proverb of the day. Um, so um, as we as we dive in there, um, would you, if you've got your Bible with you, why don't you open it to Luke's chapter 19 this morning? Um, our proverb of the day is more than one today um, because it's just... It, it's the whole proverb. It's just more than one verse. Are you ready? <clears throat> it says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. That's challenging, right? If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. It says that rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? That's a, that's a tough verse, huh? And I, and I kind of wonder, as we talk about the, the gospel, <clears throat> how often do we see uh, friends and colleagues wandering towards the slaughter? And how quickly are we to share the gospel with them, knowing um, where the end is heading? So let's, let's be encouraged to share the good news of Jesus and not, not be um, ashamed of it. Amen? All right, so we're going to dive in this morning. Like I, I said, we're going to dig into um, really uh, celebrating Palm Sunday because it's, it's a huge deal. This is a, it's a monumental moment in history. Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest days um, history has ever seen takes place on Palm Sunday. And we get to celebrate it today because Easter doesn't happen without Palm Sunday. Um, this is the day that, that Jesus comes in and he declares his messianic claim, where he's actually coming to the place like it's been hinted at. His, his disciples know it, but he's yet to come to a place where he's publicly displaying it. And, and this is that moment. And so that's what we, we celebrate today in Palm Sunday is Jesus making his entry into Jerusalem in, in preparation for the cross. So we're going to read um, in Luke chapter 19, um, starting in verse 28. Let's read together. It says this, and when, they had, uh, when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, he set two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Um, that's important because that meant uh, if you go back into the Old Testament, anytime um, that, that an offering was sacrificed, it was always uh, blameless. It was always a... Um, an animal that had never, never been worked. It was, it was perfect. And, and that's what Jesus is after. But can you imagine riding on a colt that no one else has ri ridden on before? And that, that's where Jesus is making his entry into the city. He says, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say to him, the Lord has need of it. Imagine two guys just walking up and just, they just start untying your donkey. And you're like, what, what do you think you're, what are you doing here? The Lord needs it. Um, well, o okay. I guess I can't fight that answer. It's like the Jesus answer in Sunday school. It's always, it's always right. Jesus needs it. Uh, so those who were sent away found it just as he had told them. I love that. He says, you're going to go here. You're going to find a, col a colt. No one sat on it. Uh, you're going to untie it for me. And exactly what happens. And what happens? Somebody questions them. Why are you untying it? Why are you untying the colt? And they said to him, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. Throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise. This is not just the twelve. This is the multitude of those who were choosing to, to follow the teaching of Jesus. And with a great, uh, with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is a moment that, that these disciples have been waiting for. 
They've been anticipating this. They've been actually pushing for it to happen. There's been moments where the, the crowds, the energy of the crowds around Jesus, they're wanting to make him king. And I can only imagine the excitement of his disciples as this moment's finally happening. And they're starting to recognize what's going on as Jesus is coming in. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why, are, why do they need rebukes? Because they are worshiping this human man in the flesh. Jesus has not allowed it to this point. Anytime that praise has come, he said, My hour has not yet come. But here he is. He's not only just simply allowing it. Jesus is demanding it. This moment is demanding it. Rebuke your disciples. And he said to them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. That's so powerful. The, the moment demands worship. So much that if not a single voice was raised. The stone, the rocks, the rocks would cry out. My hope is someday uh, to travel to the Holy Land and grab myself a rock from the road to, to keep it on my desk. And when anyone asks, it'd be like, that rock will cry if no one else does. It, it's, it's one of those rocks. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we, we are just grateful to... Uh, to be in your house this morning, Lord. I pray that, um, Lord, that you would be glorified as your word is preached, Lord. Um, would, you, would you speak something new, fresh, Lord, of your Holy Spirit this morning, Lord? I pray, um, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts um, in tender ways, Lord. But I pray that you would, um, you would reveal to us the things that need revealed, Lord. Would you convict where there's conviction needed, Lord? Um, and we just thank you for the way that your word teaches us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This, um, like I said, th this moment that we see in, in history is so long anticipated for. Long anticipated for. And I don't know if you, you've ever waited eagerly for something. I can, I can think of many moments where I was excited about something, waiting, can't wait to go, um, all of the, those things, um, and, and just uh, that long anticipation drawing near. I, I think about um, this last summer, we got to go to Yellowstone for the first time, and the whole kind of like drive out there is just this, this eager anticipation. Um, or, or maybe it's, uh, maybe a lot of you could, could relate to uh, the birth of a child. When you have your, your first child and, and all through the, the, the term of pregnancy, it's just that kind of eager anticipation. You don't even know like the, the, the true excitement that's around the corner. It's unknown. It's kind of a, a mystery, but you're so excited to bring life into the world. Um, but sometimes uh, waiting is difficult. Sometimes it's not easy. And I would say, especially like pregnancy, I think is a, is a great example of that because it gets, it, seem, it just gets harder and harder the closer you get. Not harder um, as much as anticipation, but just plain physically harder, right? Like, like it, it should be getting easier the closer you get. And no, it's getting more agonizing and, and the heartburn gets worse and the sleep gets worse and suddenly I don't have any bit of the bed left to have. <laughs> I was talking about my heartburn, of course. <laughs> Where it, it, it seems to just grow, it gets harder and harder and you're like, can this finally be over with that eager anticipation? This morning I want to preach to you uh, if I can, a sermon titled, Waiting Eagerly. Waiting Eagerly. That is where um, the, the Jewish tradition, the, the Hebrews, they were waiting eagerly for the coming of their Messiah. And here it is finally coming. And I just like, in a way, little do they know what will actually be taking place. 
We talked about this a bit yesterday um, at the end of our uh, Thrive 101 class that the, the Hebrews knew about the coming of the Messiah. They knew it was coming. They, they waited. They were eagerly anticipating um, th- their Messiah that would free them from bondage and from slavery, who would choose to rule righteously, but they only knew bits and pieces of the plan. They didn't have the, the fullness of the revelation of the plan of Jesus, but yet anticipation for that moment just continued to build, and it had been building for a long time, thousands of years of anticipation for the moment that we're reading about today. Thousands of years. God hinted at it in the garden when the curse is placed on Adam and Eve. It says this in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he's speaking to the serpent, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The bruising of the head referring to as Jesus comes. There's going to be a time when that bruising would happen. Jacob spoke of it when he blessed Judah in his last few words to his sons. He says this in Genesis 49.10, And the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Speaking to the day that the Messiah would come and finally reign over the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 18, spoken to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Again, promise after promise of the coming of the Messiah. Jeremiah 23, uh, 5 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for you from uh, for David a righteous branch and as you as you watch in scripture the promises bring more and more and more detail as they get closer to the coming of the Messiah we start to learn more and more it was just bruising the head but now we're we're seeing that it's going to come from the line of David he he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. More specifically, we start to see that it will that the, the Messiah will be born of a virgin. All of these different things giving more and more glimpses, more and more hope, greater and greater anticipation of the day that he would come to reign. And that is what is happening on Palm Sunday. Jesus is coming in and saying, I am the king, the long-awaited king. The crowds around Jesus, they're starting to recognize that there is, there's something different. His disciples are beginning to see him as the Messiah. He asks them, who do they say that I am? Well, some think you're a prophet and some think you're Elijah. Who do you say that I am? We know that you are the Lord. You are the one. You are the Messiah. And they've made several attempts up to this point that they would have made him king. There's a, there's a moment when he gets word that, that John the Baptist has been killed and he uh, Jesus, in, in an attempt for, I think, some grieving process, he says, I'm going to go away. He crosses the lake, and the crowds follow him, and he ministers to the crowds because he has compassion um, with them. And then he sends his disciples away, and he dismisses the crowds. And part of the, the reason that he's trying to get away from the crowds is because they're trying to make him king. And his disciples were there trying, he had to make his disciples go away first so that they would not partake in the trying to make him king because they were the most excited ones about it. And now he is finally, he's not, he's not denying it any longer, he's making the arrangements for it. He's not just allowing it to happen. 
he's arranging this moment prophetically lining up with scripture and making sure because this is the day palm sunday the day that he rides in it is the day that had been prophesied about not just not just the moment but the day that had been promised about and those that refuse to acknowledge it he says to them um he says, oh, that would you have known the day that makes for your peace. He comes and gets a glimpse of Jerusalem, and it says that he weeps over the city. And he says, would that you have known for this day. You should have known this day that makes for your peace. For us, I'll, I'll say this. He's making it really clear. And in, in this, this whole picture of Palm Sunday, riding into Jerusalem on a, on, on a donkey that's never been sat on before. It's a perfect picture, clear as day for the crowd. And I think for us, um, we might think that it's probably a really odd entry for uh, the one who would reveal himself as the Messiah, riding on a donkey. But for the Hebrew people, It would speak something inside of them and trigger their knowledge of the Messiah. I want to make just one point here real quick that um, this is his claim to be king. It's his claim to be king. He's making a statement to all of his fellow Hebrews that he is the king that has been waited for. Not just a king, but Messiah the king that has been preached about for hundreds of years. And in this, like I said, the, the imagery speaks to it. For us, it's kind of like weird, like, okay, um, they're starting to recognize and they're praising Jesus as he's coming in on, on this donkey, but it's, it's prophetic and, and it's a picture that should ignite something and trigger something inside of them because he's repeating, he's repeating the, the same ride that Solomon took, that, that, that David set his son Solomon on to declare him as the rightful heir of David's line. On, this, on a donkey, riding through the, the Kidron Valley into Jerusalem, Solomon rode the, the same march in saying, David is saying, here is my son coming in peace because he's coming on a donkey, not on a war horse. Here he is coming in peace. He is the the rightful heir. It's a picture that would have provoked the Pharisees as soon as they see it. And I think that's why they say, rebuke your disciples. What are you what are you doing? Make them stop. And, And it says this blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest. He's making not the entry I think that they wanted him to make. The the Pharisees probably hoped that he would make. He's making the entry of peace into the city. The Messiah that brings peace. The king has come. Number two, it's fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Zechariah uh, nine nine says this: Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your King is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is He. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. It's perfectly prophetic, lined right up with what has been prophesied. And so they should see this and know. And it says, no, they rebuked it instead. They should see it and they should know. He's fulfilling prophecy. They ought to be celebrating. But here's this this point that I want to make here is that just because it's prophetic and just because it's anticipated and eagerly waited for, does not mean it's how they expected it or wanted it to happen. 
And I think we, we should somewhat wrestle that a little bit, that just because it's perfectly lined up with how it was prophesied to be, they eagerly waited for this time. Doesn't mean it's how they wanted it to happen. And I think that's what we begin to see in the Pharisees because he comes in on a donkey. This is their, their king who, who's supposed to save them from the oppression of the Romans and take back their land. And he comes in on a donkey declaring peace. I think um, they knew that the Messiah would bring peace to Israel but I'm not sure that they care that it would bring peace to Rome and that it would bring peace to the oppressing nation that was over them. But here is Jesus coming in on a donkey declaring, I'm coming in peace in the name of the Lord. I think they wanted the war horse version. I mean, you see his disciples, that's what they're after. John and his brother, the sons of thunder, right? That's what they get named the sons of thunder. Why? Because there's a moment in scripture where they get some people who, uh, who call them some names and they're like, Jesus, just rain down rocks from heaven and kill these guys. That's what we should do. That's the, that's the anticipation. They want, they, they, they want the Jesus coming in on the war horse. How, I mean, I think for us, especially as like uh, American men, you know, I, I, I grew up in the, the, the Braveheart, you know, knowing, knowing Braveheart. And what's the, the saving Jesus that I want? I look at Revelation, and I, I see the description of Jesus, and it's on the white horse, cloaked in white. And he, he's got king of kings on, written down his thigh, and his, his cloak is dripping in blood. And it says that out of his mouth comes a sword. And I'm like, that's it. He's coming back. Let's go. I think they're, they're anticipating that's how their, their king is going to come back. Their king is coming. And here he comes in peace. And even with all of their hope and anticipation in the waiting, they miss the fullness of the moment. They miss the fullness of the moment. As Jesus comes over the hill, he weeps. Would that you have known. You, of, of all of the people, you should have known that on this day, the things that make peace for you, and they're now hidden. This was the moment that was primed for celebration. Primed for celebration. If Nothing else would have happened if it would have been a silent moment in the crowd. The rocks would have cried out because it was a moment primed for celebration. Here's the thing. Is that he says, would that you have known that they should have known. And not just because of all of like. The, the prophecies, the, the picture of him coming in on a donkey. But you can go back, and, and this moment, was it was prophesied down to the day that he enters into. You go and, and you study out the prophecies in Daniel chapter 9, and you calculate it out, and you will find that Jesus came in on the exact day that Daniel said he would come into Jerusalem. They should have, they ought to have known. They should have known that when his birth came, and yet the men from the east had to come and tell them. They should have known. I think you and I can find ourselves, as, as we sit, we're, we're 2,000 years past that moment, but yet we're still here finding ourselves waiting for our king. Because he's coming back. We should be waiting in expectation that the king of kings is soon in coming back. You and I, the king's coming. Let me encourage you, don't miss out on it. Don't miss it. 
the scripture compares the, the time that, that we're in right now with, with birthing pains. And I only have secondhand experience uh, with birthing pains. So I, I can't really speak to it very well. But I know this, that they intensify as the time draws near. They get harder. They get more intense as, as the days draw near. In the, in the early days, and it's like, for the most part, nothing but excitement. You feel the, the change is happening, but as the months pass on, pregnancy only gets harder, right? Sleepless nights, uncomfortable. There's not a single pair of pants that is comfortable. And like you can't sleep on this side or that side. And everything is, let's be honest, it's the worst. But there's eager anticipation, right? It gets harder and harder. It gets harder as hope draws near. Romans 8.18 says this. Paul speaking, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, hear this, because we are in this present time and there are sufferings in this present time, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Just like having a child. Soon. As hard as it might be in the moment, the the suffering passes and it's not worth comparing to the joy of new life. I think think it's a great picture that the scripture paints for us in that. As we wait, as, as hope for the soon coming king to make his return, know that this suffering will not compare to the glory that is to come. We're in this waiting moment, eagerly waiting and anticipating, just like the Hebrews then were waiting for the soon coming king to come back. He's going to make a return. But that knowledge doesn't always make it easy in the moment. Just like the excitement of new life doesn't necessarily make labor easy. Like it's something to look forward to, but I think you get to the point in the middle of it where you're like, I'm not sure I want this anymore. (laughs) I I remember when we had our our first, there was there was a moment that and and we we did the uh, the home birth all all natural route and, and Beth goes, I can't do this. Like in, in the moment of intense labor, like I can't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. It it gets harder. And sometimes the, the knowledge doesn't necessarily make it easier. So how do we wait in this season and not grow weary? How do we wait for the coming king and not grow weary? If you're taking notes, number one is this, keep hope alive. We have to choose to keep hope alive. As we gather as a church, as we we come together, we need to encourage each other and keep hope alive alive. It's always good to have somebody when you're giving birth who's like, you can do it. It's gonna be okay. We have to do that for each other and keep hope alive. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. We have to hold on to the hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. We're going to get through it. He who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, 
not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. Man, get to church. Help your friends get to church because we need to come together and encourage each other and keep hope alive without wavering. But encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day of his return. So I I just think every time I read this scripture, I think about that idea of we have to do this more and more exponentially, if you will, as the day draws near. Paul wrote that 2,000 years ago. So how much more should we be by this point saying we have to encourage each other? Because we're getting deeper into the labor pains where it's only getting harder. So we need more and more and more encouragement. Let's keep hope alive. Number two is that we share the good news. Share the good news. This is one thing that I just absolutely love about our our Foursquare movement. One of our four pillars is that Jesus Christ is the soon coming king. We have to share that good news. He's the soon coming king. He's coming back again. We need to have hope in that. He's going to restore all things to himself. The earth, we just read, all of creation is eagerly waiting for that moment. We need to partake in that eager waiting with creation. The king's coming back, and we got to share that good news with the people around us. The world around you, your friends, your family, your coworkers, they need the hope of the return of Jesus. They need the hope of salvation. We got to share that. I'm going to have the, the keys come up as I, as I close here. Number three is this. We choose to rejoice. We keep hope alive. We choose to rejoice. Let me just say this. Don't let the rocks do all the talking. Don't let the rocks do all of the talking. Let's choose to rejoice that we have hope in a soon coming king. We have hope in the king of kings that's coming back. Let's rejoice in that. Don't leave the eager waiting to only happen with creation. We should be eagerly waiting. I don't want Jesus to come and have to weep over us that we weren't on our knees waiting for the return because he's coming back and he's he's coming back with force. The day is coming. We need to rejoice because the king is coming in the name of the Lord. Glory in the highest. So here's my 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 closing question. Will we allow the groaning of the birth pains to be our song? Or will the eager anticipation of the soon coming king be our anthem? We get to make the choice in in what way we choose to wait in this time. Do we choose to wait full of hope, eagerly anticipating, rejoicing, sharing the good news? Or do we allow our hope to be snuffed out by the pains and the suffering of this world? Because Paul says these will be nothing in comparison to the hope that's to come. Let's choose to rejoice in this time, to celebrate glory in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna comes the King in the name of the Lord. But let me say this. If the times are wearing on you, because it happens, 
it gets hard in this season. If the times are getting hard and it's wearing on you, come here. Make this a priority to get encouraged, to get fed, to get lifted up. Come and get refreshed by the Lord. Take his yoke upon you because his burden is light. Sing his praise in the house of the Lord with the rest of the congregation. Get encouraged, get hope filled. Amen. Let's pray.